because I feel maybe this is part of the process we're all in rather than well, I need to change this. I feel, well, maybe this needs to run its course because in running its course, people will come to a realization this isn't it or this isn't going to work or this is this is pretty much useless. So I don't often get inspired to be involved politically or in other ways to change things because I feel maybe the shaking of the systems will bring people to a realization that there are no political answers or there are no humanistic answers. There's just the kingdom of God, which is going to be the answer. I'm still trying to work through learning how to pray for others or come into others' heart in agreement with what he wants to do in situations. And I had an experience the other day where I was before father with a friend that's dealing with a disease in her body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I'm still personally working through a healing myself in my body. And, and he's been highlighting some legal rights that the enemy had in place with it. And so as I was praying and coming into agreement with Father's heart for my friend, I, I got a sense, I felt the Father crying over her. And I, and I felt that it was, that he was saddened because of the legal right that was in place. And hmm. that it was, and, and it was like, you know, I really didn't know how to go about it because, you know, the legal rights with, with it, you know, being her, her stuff. Hmm. And so um, that's my question, Mike, is that when, when there's legal rights with others that we would like to see come and manifest healing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, if someone gives you permission to engage for them, then you have some measure of authority in dealing with the legal right. But ultimately, the person themselves still has to agree, deal with what gave the legal right themselves. You know, um, therefore, sometimes we can act in proxy if people can't do it themselves. But ultimately, they still have to become free from whatever the situation was. They can't. So, OK, we get a verdict from the court, but they don't apply the verdict. The verdict has to be applied for someone to be free and then someone to receive the benefit of that freedom. Um, so ultimately, you can engage with someone in the same encounter and help them to deal with the legal right. Um, but if if you're dealing with it on their behalf, ultimately, you still have to share with them what the accusations were and uh, they have to apply that legal right in their own lives. Um, I remember many years ago when we were first engaging the court system, we had a lady who um, basically was uh, in the hospital in ICU, told she was probably going to die. Um, and we suffice it to say she had many accusations against her a lot of them to do with how she treated her body and how she was living. Um, and we dealt with them on our behalf. We assigned, uh, actually went into the, in the spirit, went into the hospital room and within five days she was out and home. But then we, we felt we had to tell her what we had done so that she could own those things legal rights or or recognize what they were and then deal with them but in reality she refused to she didn't want to own the any changes in her life or even own that she was contributing to anything in her own life and actually she she was so insistent she left the church uh, and ended up in a motor scooter and all that sort of stuff because she didn't want to admit and own the things that she needed to change in her life to stay in health. Uh, and that's the truth for a lot of people. Just receiving healing doesn't mean health. Health is not just a state with no sickness. It's a state of mind and attitude in which you live in the benefit of a completely different relationship with God and with your own body. 
and it requires people to own that for themselves to stay healed yeah uh, we we did a healing outreach many years ago um on a an estate in in our local town at the time and we we put a tent up on the green and invited people to come for healing and there was this lady who came in with a with sticks um chronic arthritis really really bad got healed walked off flicking her stick around her head walked off i went to see her a week or so later uh, to find out how she was she said oh, i'm doing great um, but i can't live without my my sickness benefit i still i need my sickness benefit to be able to live I mean, I didn't say anything. I mean, I could have said, well, why don't you just go out and get a job, you know, like other people. But ultimately, she, she so within a short period of time, she got everything back because she wanted the money for a sickness that she didn't have. And therefore, she got the money back. She got the money and she got the sickness. Um, and in a sense, there there's a change of attitude and a change of mindset and making sure that we uh, do not stay in agreement with any legal rights or with anything in terms of where our mindsets are out of sync. Um, and that takes uh, a diligent effort from people, you know, and a lot of people you can lay hands on and they could get, they could get healed, but that doesn't mean in their mind they're healed. They may have their body healed, but are, has, has their thinking changed? to enable them to stay in that state of health. And some people just don't want to change. You know, if they do want to change and you can help them with the thinking and the processes, but often if there is a legal right revealed, they have to accept that legal right to accept the verdict that gives them freedom from that legal right. And I, I remember to quite often when in the early days of doing court cases in heaven, people would be really reticent to accept the accusation because they just didn't want to admit. Um, and ultimately, for me, it was like, well, put your hands up, accept the accusation, because even if there's, you can't even agree with the accusation, probably generationally, there is agreement in that accusation in your family or whatever else. So in a sense, what's the problem? Pride, often. <laughs> It stops yeah. people agreeing with the accusation because they don't want to admit anything. But you have to admit the accusation to receive the verdict of freedom from the mm -hmm. accusation. And then you have to apply the verdict to stay free and maintain that verdict. Often there are neural pathways linked to behavioral patterns, and that could be including sort of thinking and, and other behavioral patterns that could lead to sickness. If you receive the verdict for health and wholeness, then your mindsets have to change towards those patterns of thinking. And some people are fearful. Some people are afraid of sickness, cancer or disease. And that's what opens the door in the first place. Some people, um, when they're when their mindsets to do with those things, you know, their thinking isn't aligned with the truth, you know. Um, and something happens, they get a symptom and they spiral down, you know. And again, many times I talk to people, oh, I did a court case. And I said, well, how did, how's that working? Well, it didn't work. <laughs> now, the court case worked. Their application of the court case probably didn't work because they thought it was automatic and they didn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. But you have to apply it. You know, and I think that's the important thing. And when you're working with other people, you know, you've got to try and help them navigate through that process for themselves so that they eventually can maintain the power of the verdict in their own life. I think I told you this many, many years ago. One of my earliest visions, uh, the Lord showed me um, what appeared to be an atomic bomb hitting you know, you know how it hits and then it spreads out, you know, in every, you know, 360 degrees, all the power goes out into the land from the mushroom cloud. 
And I fell to my face and I'm like, Lord, why are you showing me this destruction? He says, I'm showing you power. <laughs> he says, I'm showing you the power I'm going to drop. You know, I'm going to drop onto you and it's going to spread out around you. And that mushroom cloud is going to be uh, the fragrance of Thanksgiving coming back up to me. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, he was just showing me in, you know, our language, something that was going to happen, you know, or how he was going to empower me. And I am going through this season right now, because remember I told you how he's always, you know, he takes me up and now he's been putting my feet back on the ground, plugging me back in to release things. I mean, I can just be driving and this wave of melancholy emotion come over me and it's like going through me and I'm like what's going on I am not an emotional person I mean I'm passionate about things but I'm not an emotional mm. and I go in these areas and I feel this wave coming through me and I'm like what is this <laughs> I don't know it's you know sometimes I'm even to tears and I'm like I don't understand what's going on and I'm wondering could that be it could he be releasing you know, tangible, heavenly emotion or compassion or something through me in areas? Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, in a sense, if we're going to be moved by what moves him, we need to feel what he feels. And now you could say, well, God isn't, you know, doesn't have those sort of emotions. Well, why would we have emotions if he doesn't? Love is a, an emotion as well as a choice. And therefore, I do feel probably God wants you to feel some of the things that he's feeling in a situation so that you can operate out of his heart of compassion and you can operate not purely on a, well, I'm going to do the what's right here, but you're feeling and sensing. Um, and in a sense, if you're going to engage creation, creation in any way, we've got to feel the groan of creation. We've got to feel creation's loneliness and lostness and separation from man um, if we're going to answer creation's groan. We're going to be revealed as sons of God. I, I think Jesus wept. Now, he wasn't weeping for um, Lazarus because he knew Lazarus was going to be resurrected, but he was weeping for the pain that Mary and Martha were feeling. And he identified with their pain and wept um, to show his uh, compassion for what they were feeling. So I definitely feel that God um, can move in us with a revelation of his heart, which will carry with it, you know, emotional feelings. Um, it's then what you obviously do with those emotional feelings is to outwork in doing what the father is doing. You know, only doing what we see the father doing or what he, what we're feeling and sensing from him, you know. But, you know, I could just be in a particular area. I mean, really, even just driving down the street and it's just it's just all of a sudden this wave and it flows over me and or in up after it flows up out of me. And I'm like, you know, don't let me miss it. What am I supposed to be doing? And I'm looking. I don't you know, I don't see anything different. I'm just driving down the street and it's just oh it's uh, I, yeah. I mean sometimes you know when you go back and you look at some of the things where it talks about the blood crying out from the ground and i think sometimes we're feeling and connecting to what's happened in a place it's history um, some of the issues that are going on in a place are connected to historical events things that are in the ground um, where particularly where you know things have happened which have um, been contradictory to God's desire and purpose for an area for people of an area that we can feel it and we can sense it and we can connect to it and then be motivated through that connection to respond you know as the father would have us respond so I would go with it you know don't try and resist it, but ask the father, you know, always, what is it that I you want me to do with this? You know, because emotions do um, motivate us. 
you know, when you feel compassion, it moves you. When Jesus talked about feeling compassion, the word he used, the Greek word, which is a, a quite a strange sounding word, something like spleglitzomai, meant to be moved in the guts. It's like almost like you get that kick in the guts that like, whoa, pain, effectively. And that compassion moved Jesus to, to, to act. And I think if we're to feel the way he feels, and the way creation feels and what is um, injustice in the land or things that have happened in a particular place or an uh, area, then, you know, I think that's something that definitely can move us to respond how God would want us to respond in a particular area or situation like that. So, yeah. Um, it's so interesting, Pam. Um I think this might have to do with what Justin teaches on, which is cardiogenosis. Mm. Um, and in fact, that was the question I was going to ask you this morning, Mike. Mm. Um, you know, this whole idea, you know, where, he, and this is the part I thought was so interesting. And it might, you know, might be something you think about too, Pam. Um, but he was talking about how, you know, you open your love gate. And then he was talking about expanding one's heart, you know, in cardiognosis. And then um, he connects that to various things in discernment, you know, and I think discernment you could think of as you can sense it, you can, you know, you can feel it, you can have a knowledge about things, et cetera, but it's essentially related to discernment. And for example, you know, he, he gives several different illustrations, but, you know, a simple one would be when you need to discern, is this a person you can trust or not trust? And he emphasized you do this not in a, in a critical or judgmental way, but you do it in a loving way. But sometimes you just have to know, you know, maybe it's some kind of situation you're in. You have to know if you can trust a person. Um, and he also relates it to making, having to make decisions, making decisions in terms of correcting, uh, selecting the correct timeline. And so he gives a lot of different illustrations for this. So I was thinking, you know, Mike, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have something to say about it. Or maybe you can expand, you know, the conversation on that. Because I think, personally, I, I really resonated with that. I thought it was an incredibly important a uh, thing to talk about, and he's kind of mentioned made a mention uh, a mention of it a few times. I think at least two of his videos, uh, and one was very recently. Hmm. So I don't know if you you know might be able to expand yeah. or add something here. Yeah, I mean, I think I think cardiogenosis often is is perceived to be connected to the father's heart. And therefore, the knowledge of his heart, which is true. And I think, you know, heart to heart relationship with him will give us a, a knowledge of his heart or an unf unfolding of, of that truth of his heart. And it, it's almost like not a cognitive thing where we're getting him telling us things, but we're knowing it's the knowing. And obviously, if we're going to feel the heart of God, our heart has to expand. We cannot contain the heart of God in a, in something which is the fractured or damaged or broken heart that we might have. So we have to find wholeness and then our, our heart needs to expand and increase in its capacity for compassion, for love, um, because we, we're growing, we're maturing. And that is a level of love which which requires an expansion of our heart to do it and then we can choose to open our heart towards things or we can close our heart towards things and i think to open our heart is to give access to our heart to those things that god is working with or working for and in which when we feel his heart god wants us to respond out of his heart be motivated with his heart but to engage our heart with it not to do it by duty or obligation or feel 
oh, God, show me something. I suppose I better do this. But to feel and be motivated by that desire or compassion when we begin to know his heart and discern his heart. And all of that is is a cardiogenosis type intimacy revelation. But we can open our hearts also towards other things. You know, many times when I felt creation, my heart is engaged with creation in a way which expanded my heart. It's like I felt the sadness, the loneliness, the disconnect of creation. And it expanded my heart and my desire for creation's restoration and freedom. So sometimes when we engage with a situation, it can cause us to respond in such a way that our heart expands towards it and we have a greater dimension of of love towards that or and feelings and emotions towards something that before we may have only seen in a uh a, in one way and not felt as strongly and i think when we uh, operate in sonship and in the desires of sonship it will enable us to see things differently and to feel things differently and sense things differently and therefore we won't be oblivious to what's going on uh, but we'll engage it and i can reach out to creation and engage in cardiogenosis with creation i can open my heart to feel what creation is feeling and engage it i can open my heart to someone else you know quite often when i go to conferences you know i don't i'm not doing conferences at the moment but when i've done them in the past i choose to open my heart and spirit to people and i surround that place um wherever it might be to create a safe environment for people to engage with me and so that I will feel and sense and be drawn to talk about the things that they require or need or want. Um, because I've opened my heart and I've expanded my heart around a place. And, and I used to do that with my spirit. And if I engage my spirit around something, it sort of created a safe place for it. But I needed also to engage my heart in it because it's not just the safe place, but I want an engagement place. So I have to be willing to feel. You know, now I think years ago there was a lot of call for empathy and we were to empathize with people and people's pain. And some people would, you know, be sort of intercessors and they'd be wailing and rolling around the floor and things like that. And I don't think that's really what it's talking about. It's not, I'm going to feel someone's pain and I'm going to be emotionally broken. It's, I'm going to relate to where someone is and be motivated to engage that for the good, not just sort of sympathize. You know, and I think some of what I saw in intercession, oh, I just didn't like it. <laughs> You know, it was, you know, it might be just me that I'm not sort of mercy gift orientated, perhaps. But I just felt all they're doing is wailing, but they're not doing anything. Is that going to do anything? Maybe it did. I don't know. But I didn't feel that that was where I was. Um, and I certainly didn't respond that way very often. But I do feel I can choose to open my heart. I can choose to engage my heart and my emotions to feel and sense and be more connected to a person or a situation or creation itself, which I think in terms of cardiogenosis, see knowledge is not intellectual knowledge. Knowledge is to know by experience. And if you don't open your heart to the experience of something, you're not going to know. You're just going to have information about. Now, information about something is not what knowledge is about. You know, and therefore my testimony is knowledge, true knowledge. Um, and I do believe that God wants us to be involved holistically 
in situations and sometimes even your body can react and sense a situation or, or a particular dynamic um which is sort of the whole of us engaged you know and i think i used to engage my spirit more because i felt more comfortable with that but over time i think my emotions got more involved and i my heart was more involved and i engaged heart to heart in a way that i didn't do before uh, and i think that's because i feel i've connected more to the heart of god and deeper to his heart that inspires me and moves me in a way that it didn't before and i think that's i think sort of growing in the knowledge um i guess what one of the things that i was like okay you know I, i sort of get this basic concept and i think we've all had you know some of this experience you know you know where you feel the pain of other people and you you extend compassion and um there are a lot of, uh, you know, in a sense, a lot of dimensions to this. But one of the things I was thinking about, he was really talking about expanding, mm. you know, his heart, you know, that he expands it over spaces. He expands it over geographical locations. And mm. I'm thinking, how do we grow in that? What are what are the practical steps in uh, terms of, of actually engaging in that way? That's what I'm kind of... Well, I think we will engage with different dynamics differently depending on how we're wired. Now, Justin is mercy gift, very strong mercy gift. So he feels quite intensely about things and he's motivated by those feelings to operate in mercy and to operate that way. Whereas I come from prophet teaching gift when I engage the same situation, I can engage it with my heart and I can expand my heart, but I'm going to respond to that situation differently than he would because I'm not mercy gift. Therefore, the way I engage is to be me. And the way he engages is to be him. And the way you engage is to be you. So although we can en- expand our heart to engage the dynamic, how we respond to that dynamic may be very different depending on uh who we are and how we are going to operate out of who we are see i could never be justin mm-hmm. you know at a comp- we had a conversation last week in which he was sharing some of his uh feelings towards certain things that are going on and he was passionately evolved and i'm sitting there like oh okay you know you know mm-hmm. just not moved in the same way at all because i'm not mercy gift and and therefore i'm going to respond quite differently often in the the best way i can help someone is not necessary to show them mercy but to give equip them through wisdom or knowledge or insight and so understanding how something functions in a you know the prophetic redemptive gift is not prophesying it's viewing the world in a way that understands how it functions and understands, therefore, what to do in a situation. Um, therefore, you know, I might teach someone how to stay free when someone else might be ministering mercy to get them free. And I think it requires, you know, different ways of engaging people and different ways of engaging situations. So when I engage a wider sphere, I might be motivated to do something in that sphere through who I am rather than through someone else. And I think all of us need to be free to be us, but all of us do need to be willing to engage, you know, because ultimately if I look at a situation and I just don't feel anything, Either the father's not motivating me or showing me his heart towards that, therefore I'll just stay out of it. Or if I do engage what the father's heart is, what I do will be what his heart for me is to do, not what his heart for someone else is to do. 
you know, and sometimes I can be moved really strongly in a situation which I like completely don't feel anything to towards to start with. And I can be quite dispassionate and look at situation and sort of not really feel moved. And all of a sudden, the father engages my heart with it. And all of a sudden, it's like, I'm passionate. And where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from me naturally. It came from me experiencing something of God's heart. But what I will do with that passion will be different from maybe what someone else will do with that passion. Mm -hmm. And I think, therefore, <clears throat> our heart is engaging who we are. Um, yeah, not trying to be like somebody else. Um, Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Um, but I think all of us as sons have a connection to creation, and that includes people and situations. And that connection is something that we can increase and grow and i've had experiences that have strengthened that connection and i've had you know spaghettification experiences where i've engaged with creation on a sort of a particle basis or a quantum basis of being entangled with it you know i didn't understand it when i had it originally you know probably back in 2010 or 11 i had some experiences where I just felt whoa creation and all of a sudden i felt the weight of the need for restoration for the whole of creation and i've had a number of experiences sort of during the last 10 years which have enhanced that and caused me to feel and engage in a in a way um and then god sort of started to share with me the pleasure he has in creation even in its state right now there is still beauty in it there's still the nature of it that is still beautiful it's still wonderful and you know and i enjoy god's enjoyment and sometimes we just hang out you know i might just be outside and i might be doing something and i just feel the father's smile and i feel the father's pleasure and as I'm engaging with creation, I feel and sense that heart. And that might be on a very small thing. You know, it might just be um, a little thing. But when I, every day I go out and feed the birds and, you know, and I've got a whole array of different foods I put out for them, you know, different seeds, different stuff, you know, and, and I go out and I feed them. And then usually we sit and look through the window and look at the birds eating and feeding and just, Thing. and i feel the father's desire upon that and it might be something really simple and it doesn't seem to have any real you know cosmic consequences but actually for the father there's pleasure in me engaging even at that smallest level um, and i feel that there you know will be an expansion of our connection to creation itself um, and sometimes that can seem very disconnected from what's going on on the ground you know and ultimately i think my belief for the restoration of all things and which i strongly passionately believe in means that i don't necessarily feel as motivated as someone like justin to try and do something legislatively to change something in the here and now because i feel maybe this is part of the process we're all in rather than well i need to change this i feel well maybe this needs to run its course because in running its course people will come to a realization this isn't it or this isn't going to work or this is this is pretty much useless um, so I don't often get inspired to be involved politically or in other ways to change things because I feel maybe the shaking of the systems will bring people to a realization that there are no political answers or there are no humanistic answers. There's just the kingdom of God, which is going to be the answer. 
So I, I tend to sort of be a little bit more philosophical about things, I guess, in a broader sense. But I'm, that's me. No, I'm not saying that what Justin does or what other people do is wrong. It's absolutely what their response is. And their response will be how their hearts respond to God's heart for that situation. Um, but we're all different. And I think that's the key to be comfortable being ourselves um, in a way. And so I might do something creational in a dimensional way. And I feel that probably for myself, I feel more moved and passionate about dimensional realities and restoration than sometimes I do about what's going on on Earth. Now, maybe that's just the way I'm wired or maybe, you know, maybe I should feel more compassionate about what's going on on Earth. You know, I'm certainly motivated to drop love bombs and want to see peace on Earth and administrating that from the Earth shield and different things like that, which I definitely do. And I'm constantly doing, but I'm not sort of don't feel almost legislatively or governmentally looking well we need to change this situation or this has got to change um just you know just the way i see things and feel things differently from other people um but there's not a right or wrong you know it's just being and if i'm being me then i rejoice in other people being them because i don't have to be them which is great you know it's so it's so good to be comfortable in your own skin and not feel that you have to prove anything to anybody else you know and when people start talking about it and they're passionate about it yeah i can be, i can rejoice in that but i can feel completely not compassionate or not you know moved by it because i'm not and i don't have to gen try and generate it i can just be celebrating that other people are you know in that area moved and god is at work through them in particular areas um whereas he may be at work in me and differently in different ways you know and some people have to prepare for others so that others can do things and a lot of what i feel my role is in things is to do the he in heaven stuff to prepare for things to happen on earth um not necessarily doing the on earth things um, until god moves you you know and it's different on an individual basis person by person because if you know of course if god moves me to minister to someone or help or see something for in someone and look to help then obviously i would um but some people are quite focused in what they're seeing in behind and some people seem to be bigger picture people and i feel i'm probably a bigger picture person and seeing more of a cosmic and dynamic in a way um that is preparing for the restoration of things on earth and beyond so. as you're working with different groups of people in different settings and if you're not sensing a flow or a mandate does the father still have a have a purpose in us being in that setting or is it sometimes time to move on and you know focus more on areas that you know you have blueprints and mandates uh, i would say <laughs> that re relationship and engaging with people relationally is still important irrespective of whether you may be doing things in a way which relates to a particular mandate or blueprint um, and relationship is always god's desire and god's heart so you know i'm involved in groups of people that i don't necessarily relate to in a way of what they're doing or what they're feeling but if i can help them or support them in what they're doing and engage be there encouraging in what they're doing then i will you know and therefore you know i mean obviously i engage with people all over and there are all sorts of different levels of understanding experience and and i feel that i can um relate to all of them 
you know, so people can ask me the basics. I mean, someone in previous meeting asked me a basic question and I felt inspired by that question. And 40 minutes later, I sort of finished answering the question. And, and it was sort of at a basic level, but I shared it in a way I'd not shared it before. You know, okay. so I, I never sort of, I'm never looking at it from a, when I'm engaged with people, from a blueprint or mandate perspective, I'm looking at it as a relational perspective and how can I be an encouragement to people in their life, even if I'm not involved in doing the things they're doing, because they're still brothers and sisters, if you like. And, you know, in what I'm doing, I suppose my overall mandate is to encourage, you know, and encourage people to find out who they really are. Although in that, I don't have to do what they're doing, you know, and, but there may be some specific things that you need to be with like-minded people. If you're going to be in, in agreement with people for a specific thing, um, you need agreement, you need like-mindedness in that. And you can't really do that with people, you know, who, who aren't operating in the same area. So there are different levels of relationship and there are different levels of outworking blueprints. So mine is part of it is to encourage and help people. You know, so, you know, and I can do that irrespective of whether we connect in any real sense um, in having a same or similar mandate or blueprint um, because I want to help them with theirs. You know, part of my desire is to help people find and fulfill their destiny. Um, and I don't have to be part of their destiny to help and encourage them to fulfill it. Um, so in any situation, I think it's just knowing what you're doing in that situation and what the father would have you do. And then at times you need to move on, you know, at times that is, you know, time to come to a, an end of what you're doing in that situation and to move into another one and and only god can really direct that and give you wisdom and insight into it um, but we should never be obligated that's if, the word you know, you know that that's that's never going to be a positive motivation to be obligated to stay in a group or to remain in a group um but I see, I never feel obligated to do what I do. I feel it's a privilege and and a joy to see people and to talk to people and for people to share their stuff. And and so for me, you know, I never feel like, oh, oh not another question, you know, or, or how many times I'm going to answer this same question. I never feel that way. I just feel there's a question. If someone's got that question, what can I do? to help them gain understanding in that area. No matter if I might talk about it 50 times before, because like this morning, I never answered a question the same way like that in such a full way as I did this morning, you know? And so something, I guess, just inspired me and I was able then creatively to share um, in a way that I hadn't done before in that way. And it felt like there was life in it, you know? Um, so, you know, for me, it's always a joy to engage with people, no matter where they are, what they're, what they're doing. Um, but I don't feel necessary any need to be operating the same mandate with others or doing that in a corporate sense with people in that way. I'm, I'm, you know, content with who I am and how I'm at working that without the need um, to go see. I mean, I, I've got no desire to go and do loads of conferences again. Um, you know, um, it's just not that desire is no longer in me. Um, no other people would want me to do it. But at the moment, that isn't something that I feel is part of the, my mandate presently. So I don't feel um, pressured by people who would want me to go and do a conference or do anything else. I just don't feel that pressure. Um, 
but I know, you know, if you have a particular mandate and you're with a group of people who are almost hindering your mandate because they don't understand or they're, and there may be other people who would join together and enhance that mandate, then, you know, that's when we've really got to be open to, to shift and not to get stuck and not to feel I'm obliged to stay here in this situation. Even if others might not understand why I'm, you know, moving on or whatever, that's their issue and not mine um, in that way. And so, yeah, definitely um, we should be open to new relationships, uh, to discover others who are on the same path. Um, but, you know, I can have a relationship with people at a particular level, which doesn't require me to be on the same page as them when it comes to what they're doing or anything else. You know, and that would be true, you know, in with people I am in relationship with. I don't feel any need to do what they're doing. You know, you know and I, I rejoice in what they're doing. It's great what they're doing, but I don't feel any desire to do it whatsoever. You know, and I would never feel pressured to do it just because. You know, and, and I think this outworked like early on in the year, or I think it was late last year, you know, we were talking about doing a restoration of all things for conference and and I and I sort of got swept along with it because I have a desire for the restoration of all things. And then I had no energy. You know, even didn't want even I didn't even want thinking about it. I didn't have any energy for it, and and I was talked to the father about it, and he said, "Well, you didn't even really check it out with me, did you?" And I'm like, "No, I really didn't. I just sort of went along with it because it was like, well, yeah, that'll be great." And actually, when it came to it, I just didn't have any energy on it at all. And then I had to sort of say, "Look, I just really don't feel that I want to be involved in doing that." So, and then the others were like, oh, okay. And I said, well, you carry on if you, oh, well, we don't want to do it without you and whatever. And it's like, okay, that's okay. But, you know, I just don't feel. And so we said, okay, well, let's just shelve that. And then we started to talk about things that we were all passionate about and doing it. And it was like, ah, oh, we're all passionate about this. Why don't we do something around that? So let, let's see if the father's got us something to do around that. And, we we came back and we, we all felt yeah so we're going to do a conference on immortality you know in november and same people but energy on this is because we really felt it was the father's heart and i think i felt the other was more of a sort of a, well we ought to do something <laughs> you know rather than Actually, oh, I've got a real desire and passion to do this. Um, so I think, you know, it's okay to be upfront and honest. And I and I felt a bit guilty that I had said yes to something that then I didn't have any passion for. So then I had to say, look, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have said yes. You know. Um, yeah. So it was all about the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm hearing you say, that really... Yeah most important thing is the relationship staying in connection hmm. yeah. and then not letting uh, people's um making you feel obligated and sweeping no. you into it and you not having a passion yeah in that area yeah. okay and you know and if if they had said oh yeah we really feel we want to do and uh, that carry on with that conference i would have been praise god that's great anything i can do to help or behind the scenes that I can do spiritual work are great, but I wasn't going to go and speak at it, you know, just because I just didn't feel that I had anything to say. Now, you know, I could say tons of things, but I didn't feel any energy on it for me to actually that subject. But when the right subject came, it was completely different heart. And I just felt, yeah, I, I definitely would want to share stuff around this, you know, um, and then that's what we're going to do mm -hmm. yeah um but i'm still i would have still been relationally connected to those people if they had carried on and done something 
you know, because I I'm relationships more important to me, but I don't feel that that relationship can be used to manipulate me into anything. That's not what they were doing. They didn't do that. I was the one who was sort of, I should have, I should have been more reflective and thought, well, I need to go away and think about this rather than, oh yeah, that would be good. You know, and, and they, they weren't doing anything wrong, but my reaction was initially one of so not really checking it out with the father to see what the father's heart was what in it. And I think it's always important to know, you know, does the father, is he moving me in this? You know, and actually I then came to the conclusion, no, <laughs> he isn't. So, you know, and I should have, should have been more um, open to do that in the first place. But mm -hmm. definitely should never feel obliged to do something just because other people ask you or want you to or feel that you should um you know and you know as soon as you're doing something out of duty or obligation you aren't gonna have any passion in it you know right so uh a lot of where i'm at right now is trying to be mindful of constantly inviting father into every area of my life and I'll still catch myself, oh, I'm I'm in my own head with this again. I need to invite father into it. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. So, we can definitely operate out of um our own sort of inner needs sometimes even, you know, and and not want to let people down or not want to disappoint them. You know, and actually the worst thing to do would be to do something half-heartedly and not really be there doing it. Um, and that would be much worse than actually saying, I I don't really feel this is for me at this point, you know. Um, you know, and I would say you can be in relationship with people for mutual support and encouragement that you're not working with. For something you know people can inspire you and encourage you without actually doing things with you or you doing things with them and there are people who are always encouraging for me i feel encouraged by them even though we're not actually involved in the same things at all but they're always encouraged they're they're encouragers they're good to be around they're good to connect to and, and that for me is is a positive thing to have a relationship with people who are there for you, not there for what you do. And I think that's the purity of relationship. It is yeah. relationship not based in works. You know. Yeah. 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 And like probably people like that are few and far apart. You know, <laughs> they're not that many people that you would that are like that most of the things we are is because we're doing things connected together or in some other way but there are some people that just aren't like that they're just you just feel encouraged by them you know just because they are an encourager they're an exhorter you know they they do that's the way they are um and it's good to be around people like that um yeah but it's also good to have relationships with the people that you are doing things in one heart and one mind in one purpose with, you know, but that relationship may have been on a different level, you know, even though you're doing things together that might not be friends, friendship and relationship may be different than a working relationship in doing something together that may not require a deep level of friendship to be able to do that. And I think discernment into what the levels of relationship are and how those relationships are, are frees you and i think understanding redemptive gift is really important in relationships you know because if i'm around people who are the same redemptive gift for me i can be very encouraged and we can be but we won't get much done you know because yeah. you need you need the others to as well and therefore being in a team that has a different redemptive gift that i can impart something to and they impart something to actually can be much more productive but i probably and won't most of them as i feel and the balancing. yeah 
definitely yeah, balancing. balancing. Yeah. Because I know my redemptive gift profit, mm. but I work well with mercy. Yeah. Redemptive gift. The teacher, I get yeah. a little, you know, that's a little challenging, but yet I, I, I am learning to develop that in me more. Yeah. The teacher redemptive gift. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You know, to me, relationship is absolutely the key to yeah. to everything we do, but relationships are different and have different levels. And yes, I've been here for a long time with relationship because mm -hmm. the profit, that's the weak area of the profit yeah. is relationship. Yeah. Is that relational connection. And I've I've had a lot of different mindsets around it for years. And I, I feel that I am coming into a balance with it for mm -hmm. sure. But I'm, it's yeah. still a work in progress. I'm still having belief systems and mindsets. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, I definitely, I mean, there are three or four people that I connect to who are definitely also profit, redemptive gift. And I relate to them really well. Yes. And, it's, and we understand each other. We get each other. Mm -hmm. But we don't do things together. Because right. if we were trying to do something, we'd all do it in the same way. And it just we wouldn't get it done, you know, so they're they're mutually encouraging and it's great. And I know they get me and I get them, but it would it would be a disaster to have us in the same team trying to do everything because we wouldn't yes. we wouldn't we wouldn't do it. We would yeah. need so much else. To uh -huh. do, you know? Yeah, um, I'm I'm playing pickleball with this gal and I, I don't know her very well. I've only played a few times, but yesterday when we were playing, I said, I really have a good flow with you. She said, yeah, I know. I, I feel it with you, too. But I'm, I have a feeling that she's probably, I, I, I don't know where she's at, you mm. know, her religious walk, but uh, I have a feeling she's probably prophet. Mm. And that we can flow yeah. real well playing pickleball, but I don't know how well the relationship would go as far as. <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is why I celebrate other people who can do things that I don't, I don't, I don't like doing for a start, or right. not very good at doing. It's great that other people are, you know, and I rejoice in that, you know, which is great, awesome. Anyway, all right, I need to leave it there. So nice seeing you all. Have a good rest of your day. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment, and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.